I'm Quinn Thomas, an associate professor at Virginia Tech, and I'm going to share with you uh, a case study for an ecological forecast, a deployed ecological forecast uh, called Forecasting Lakes and Reservoir Ecosystems, FLARE, and use this description uh, and overview of this forecasting framework to introduce the cyber infrastructure and automation that is involved in generating and deploying an ecological forecast. And so to, to start, uh, I'm gonna wanna use a video to introduce this project. We call our project the Smart Reservoir Project. It really started as part of a partnership between our research team at Virginia Tech and a water utility. We want to make sure that we are treating the water in the best, most economical, high quality way we can. Around the globe, lakes and reservoirs that provide drinking water are increasingly in peril. And so our team is working to develop an early warning forecasting system for water quality for managers. And the idea is, is that similar to having weather forecasts, if we can tell managers that next week or in two weeks there's going to be an algal bloom, they can act today to improve water quality or to anticipate the bloom in such a way that they can preemptively manage the reservoir. My role is to link the sensor data, real-time information that comes through the cloud, the various computer science networks, securely, and we can translate that information into a forecast for 16 days in the future. Our partnership with Virginia Tech is allowing us to really look into the future. And one of the things the Water Authority wants to do is be innovative and be proactive, but you have to have the data that tells you how to do that. With this information that we're getting from Virginia Tech, we're able to make adjustments on our treatment side so that we can use less chemicals if we need to, we are using the right chemicals, or we are switching sources of water as needed. This information is giving us the data and the science to be proactive and make the changes that we need to to produce the best quality drinking water we can. I'm excited about the idea of co-development, realizing that it's not a one-way direction of research going to and improving the community, that the community can improve the research as well. I can come up with beautiful graphs, but if they're not interpretable, they're not useful. And I mean, that's what it means to be a land grant, is to do the research and co-develop it with the people who need it. of our project is that our students are integrating computer science, engineering, biology, chemistry, geology, and social science to develop skills that will truly allow them to predict the future of drinking water. Our forecasting system has been specifically created using open source software, sensors, and technology so that it can easily be scaled to hundreds of other lakes and reservoirs. We actually have colleagues coming here in a few months to learn more about our system so they can apply it to a suite of lakes in Europe. We're starting to be able to use what we're doing and developing here in Roanoke to improve water quality around the globe. So to build and deploy an ecological forecast, uh, particularly in an ecosystem that currently isn't being uh, observed through kind of government level or, or more kind of agency level observational systems, requires deploying the sensors and uh, really managing the cyber infrastructure. And so it really involves a interdisciplinary team that includes kind of the disciplinary uh, eco ecology uh, expertise, the computer science expertise, sensor engineers. Uh, you need um, social scientists to help uh, improve the utility of the forecast you know, for the managers, and you need uh, the water managers involved. And so this team uh, from the Western Virginia Water Authority, Virginia Tech, uh, University of Florida, and NC State, uh, under funding from the National Science Foundation, um, has kind of worked together over the past three years to generate uh, a and deploy an operational 
uh, forecasting system uh, for the water authority. And so this forecasting system is at Fallen Creek Reservoir, which is in Benton, Virginia. It's just outside of Roanoke. And it's a, a shallow uh, reservoir, uh, which is fairly small. It's the, the bathymetry is shown here on the left. Um, and it's a drinking water source that can have problems uh, with algal blooms and high metals at times, uh, which uh, the water authority wants to be able to anticipate. And so flare, um, I'll kind of, uh, the first part of this talk is to kind of give a high level overview and some of the, the, the knowledge learned from flare to kind of give you a flavor of how an ecological forecasting uh, study is kind of analyzed. Um, and then I'll go into the second half of the talk is the kind of nuts and bolts uh, uh, of, of each individual part that I'll be talking about. And so uh, the, the beginning kind of flare starts with a set of meteorology and stream inflow sensors that are deployed in the reservoir and in the catchment, and also uh, temperature, DO, chlorophyll, uh, other sensors that are in the reservoir. And uh, the data goes um, from those sensors through data loggers to a little small computer called a gateway that then is pushed uh, to the GitHub over a cellular network. And th this is an example you can see uh, here on the upper right, the computer scientist uh, out in the field deploying it. Um, and you know, all these various sensors um, are, are connected uh, via a cellular network. And a lot of this is kind of home, some of it is homegrown uh, technology, others off the shelf technology. And we try to use off the shelf technology as much as we can. And everything then gets pushed to GitHub where it's available um, with very uh, low latency. So, you know, pretty within a day of when it's collected, it's available um, uh, for use in modeling. And we have temperature, chlorophyll, dissolved organic matter, nutrients, um, and we have an on-site meteorology station. So the, the data that gets streamed up to GitHub, uh, we pull down from GitHub the model inputs uh, that are relative to, that are, that are used to drive the lake ecosystem model that we're using. And here we're using a process-based model uh, that describes using physical equations, the hydrodynamics of the reservoir. And it's a, a, a model that is widely used in the limnology community. It's an open source model. And so it's used in a range of things. Um, and we're, one, we're the, one of the first groups to use it in this sort of iterative forecasting framework. It's primarily used for kind of longer term simulations. Um, but improvements that we make to this model through the forecasting process has, uh, can help the other communities as well who are using different applications for this model by using a community uh, resource. Now that model is used to predict uh, from yesterday to today, uh, using the observed meteorology and inflows. And, that, and then that output of that model is brought together with the data from the in situ sensors to update the model. This is that update step that's been brought up multiple times um, uh, throughout the course. And for the updating step, we use the ensemble common filter. And since there was a whole lecture on this, I won't get into too much details, just to remind you that the idea is that you're running this. Uh, uh, lake model uh, many different times, in this case close to 500 times, um, that are slightly different in their initial conditions. Each of them has process uncertainty added. They have different parameters and that results in an ensemble of predictions. Now, if we say our sensor network went down, we wouldn't have any data to update it. And that would be an example here on T plus one. Uh, there's no data. Um, and so it, the, the ensembles just continue on and you know, where they are, uh, their prediction is at the end of today is where they're gonna start for tomorrow. Now, if there's observations, then uh, the ensembles get um, nudged uh, inward uh, towards the observations. And in this case, this highlights that the nudging is very strong for uh, our water temperature forecast because we have a lot of observational we have a lot of confidence in the observations of temperature. That won't be the case for a lot of ecological variables where the sensor um, it has, uh, you know, isn't as um, accurate at measuring the, um, the actual ecological thing you're interested in um, as a temperature sensor. 
And so we can look at the importance of data simulation. You could just not use data simulation and just download the observations, use those as initial conditions and run the model for 16 days. Um, but what with, a, with data simulation, we gain, um, or you could not even, uh, you could just run the model with the observations with no use of, with it, without use of observations as well. Um, and so in this particular example, we ran the model with and without data simulation. There's no forecasting here. Um, this was using observed meteorology, um, but over this um, nearly uh, 16 month time period, the blue without data simulation shows that the surface, the model is biased warm, um, and the red with data simulation falls right on the temperature observations because we have high confidence in the observations. Uh, down at the bottom of the reservoir, uh, you know, it's a little bit more clear to see in this figure the role of data assimilation because the blue um, you know, diverges, um, the scale bars are also different. So the divergence is actually quite similar between the surface and the depth. Um, but in this, you can, it illustrates example of the role of data assimilation of keeping the model um, tucked in onto the data. And why does data assimilation work well here? Well, how does it reduce the bias? One, it's tucking into the model, but two, um, it's also uh, fitting uh, parameters over time. So the parameters used in the red are slightly different than the ones used in the blue due to the parameter estimation that is occurring through the ensemble common filter. So now uh, you take that updated model from the data and that's sort of like the best estimate for current conditions and uh, you feed that into the model again to start forecasting and that uh, that, that pulls a 16-day uh, global ensemble forecast from NOAA. Um, they, they produce that. It's available every six hours and it has 21 ensemble members. We take that, we statistically downscale each ensemble member to match a historical relationship between the NOAA forecasts and the observations at the reservoir to create the drivers for the model that are then used to generate a 16-day forecast. And you know, here's an example for oxygen. Um, but it, you know they, they would look like this, where you'd see the first dot here is yesterday's, and then the next dot is today's. Um, there, you know, the reason why there's no error uncertainty here is because of the um, data simulation step having a lot of confidence in the observations, and then the forecast goes out into uh, the future with the forecast uncertainty growing. This gets pushed to GitHub. Um, both the, the the data, the output from the forecasting system gets pushed to GitHub. And this is an example of uh, what the forecast looks like, as I showed on the previous one. Um, the, the observations obviously were not collected um, you know, before a forecast, but this shows you how well the forecast is doing. On the left-hand side is a GLM-based forecast, and with the uncertainty growing, with the red being the surface and blue being the, the, the deep. Um, and then on the right-hand side um, is a, a, a null model. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of null models uh, that are commonly used. One is a persistence null, where you assume that tomorrow um, is the same as today with process uncertainty. Uh, the other common null model is climatology. Climatology is common in the meteorological community because we have observations over long periods of time. If you don't have observations over long periods of time, say at this res reservoir, then uh, a, a climatology um, is not really a tractable null. So the persistence null is the, um, you are, are kind of our first go at, at, at our baseline knowledge. And you can see here that the persistence null uh, performs um, much poor, more poorly than the, uh, than the GLM or the physics-based model, uh, particularly at the surface. So I'm gonna give you some examples of how we evaluate our forecasting system. So we've um, kind of, our last big evaluation was 475 days of forecasts. So that's every day for 475 days, we've forecasted 16 days in the future. And on the y-axis here is days in the future uh, from one to 16. And the x-axis is the bias, the difference between the forecast and the observation. So the key here is that if you average across these forecasts, there's very little bias. It's not like the surface forecast is always hotter than observed. Um, uh, th th this is, um, and, it, and that it applies both to the surface and the depth. So another way to evaluate the model is to ask how well does it compare to the null model? 
And there's a couple different ones. You need to basically get a metric of performance and apply it to both the null model and the persistence or the and the and the forecast. And our um, there's a couple different. A common one is root mean squared error (RMSE). Um, you know, we've been encouraged to use the continuous rank probability score, which I won't get into the details here, but it's analogous to the mean um, absolute error. And uh, but you is is for use with probability distributions um, because it, it it can handle it it takes into account the um, the like whether an observation falls within the distribution in addition to just the the, the mean of the distribution. And uh, the dotted line is the null persistence, so the error grows as you go out into the future, um, and the uh, the the solid lines are the forecast from the physics-based model. Uh, the red is the surface and the blue is the bottom of the reservoir. And you can see that the forecast uh, outperforms the, um, uh, you know, the null model at the surface um, over all time horizons we looked at. Uh, while at the, at the deep uh, layer, you know, saying tomorrow is the same as today is a pretty reasonable uh, model to begin with. And there isn't a huge difference between the forecast and the persistence null. We can also evaluate the, uh, the ability of the forecast, um, how well calibrated the, the confidence intervals are in the forecast. And this is called a reliability plot. Um, the way to interpret a reliability plot is on the x-axis is your confidence interval, your 90% interval, 80% interval, 50% interval. And uh, on the y-axis is the percentage of observations that fell within that forecast interval over, uh, you know, in this case, 475 forecast cycles. And the left-hand side is a reliability plot at one meters, and the right-hand liability plot is the bottom of the reservoir at eight meters. And so you want to fall on the one-to-one -one line. And so we looked at the one-day, seven-day, 16-day forecast horizons, and, and the, our, our uncertainty is, is well calibrated at the, at the, at the surface. Um, you know, at the, at the deep, you know, we, our forecast, because we're below the one-to-one -one line, our forecast confidence is too small. Um, our, you know, we had more observations fall outside of the confidence intervals than you would expect um, based on that particular confidence interval. And we also partition the sources of forecast uncertainty. So the gray box is the total forecast uncertainty uh, for a forecast. The vertical line shows you uh, where the, it switches over from being uh, a data, historical data simulation to a forecast. And interesting, you see here, uh, this is, this is the, we, the sensors went down on that one day. So you can see how the, air, the, the model uh, prediction grows if you don't have an observation, um, but then it tucks back in when you do have an observation. So again, the, the vertical line is where the shifts over to a, a, a forecast of the future. And the, the, the dotted lines are, are uh, past that you know, are observations that weren't used to constrain the model. Uh, and so you can see that uh, process uncertainty initially grows and that kind of maintains its uh, width over the full forecast interval. Um, model parameters is small, uh, much smaller than process error. Initial conditions is very small because we had an observation on the day that we started the forecast. This would be larger if we didn't have an observation on the day we started the forecast, the sensor network was down. Weather forecast um, is what we get from the NOAA. So this is determined by the 21 member ensemble. And this is uh, a, not very large, um, you know, about seven days in the future, and then it gets much larger after that. And finally, weather forecast downscaling uncertainty is that relationship between what the NOAA forecast is, uh, has predicted historically and what has been observed at the, um, at, the observ at, the, at the reservoir at our meteorology station. And so uh, we can think about how these components of uncertainty vary across time and space. And so here is a period of time that's stratified. This is the summer. Uh, and you can see that uh, the sort of the eggplant colored is process, pink is parameter. The greens are driver, both the meteorology from NOAA and the downscaling. Blue is the inflows uh, and uh, orange is initial conditions. And you can see that the surface, it's initially dominated by process uncertainty. Um, that then transfers over to being dominated by the meteorological driver uncertainty. Now, at the deep part of the reservoir, it's, it's 
primarily driven by process uncertainty, which is intuitive because the meteorology, um, it, uh, the, the, when you have the stratified reservoir, um, the, 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 sur the meteorology at the surface doesn't penetrate, doesn't have a strong influence um, below the point at which the reservoir um, is stratified. Now in the mixed period, the deep and the surface both match uh, what the, it looks like at the surface of the stratified, where the uh, process uncertainty is really important initially, um, but then the role of, of meteorological uncertainty grows over the 16-day forecast horizon. Um, so now these forecasts uh, that are generated are translated to decision support tools for the water authority. And we haven't gone through and made a complicated uh, decision support website or, or um, uh, you know, web app for them to use. We send them an email. Um, that's what they asked us to do. Um, and we talk, when we talked to them, uh, we really found that they are very interested in the fall turnover, uh, which is where high iron, which is where the, the, the surface and the, um, the deep water uh, temperatures are so similar that they can be easily mixed by wind at the surface. And what happens when that occurs is that water is pushed up, goes up from the deep to the surface, and that brings up high iron, manganese, and phosphorus from the sediments to the surface. And that results in um, a change from clear water at the surface to, on the right, uh, you know, uh, less clear water. You know, th this is one day of difference uh, here, these two uh, um, uh, bottles of water. So they want to be able to anticipate fall turnover. And so we developed this figure for them. Uh, where the x-axis is uh, switched over from the past to the future, and each dot is 16 days uh, into the future from that vertical line. And the percent chance of uh, turnover occurring is uh, on the y-axis. And we did this by looking within, uh, you know, but within an ensemble, uh, taking the difference between the, the one meter and eight meter uh, prediction, um, so, e so we get one difference for each ensemble member, and then we turn that into a probability distribution and ask, um, you know, uh, what percentage of those uh, ensembles have a difference of less than one degree? And that means that turnover has occurred. And turnover actually occurred on this red vertical line here. And so you can see as the, the managers got this email that the, uh, that as you get closer and closer to the 21st, that the probability of uh, turnover occurring starts to strengthen and get stronger and stronger and stronger until it's very confident, you know, um, a few days out, uh, which gives you time to anticipate the occurrence of this event. And now we're working on using forecasts to inform active management. Uh, and this reservoir is, has but um, a oxygen system that sits on the, the banks and it takes oxygen out of the air um, and it pumps in water, takes that oxygen out of the air, adds it to that water and pumps it back to the same depth that it was removed. And so this adds oxygen to the environment where the, the below the thermocline where anoxia uh, commonly occurs and pumps the oxygen back in there without messing with the thermal structure of the reservoir because the water temperature doesn't change, just the oxygen levels. And so we're using that um, uh, because they have the ability to actively manage, we're working on developing forecasts that address that question. So we're gonna walk from left to right here. On the left, um, the, or panel A, ask the question, will there be a benefit of turning on oxygen inputs? This is because in this case, uh, shown here in the past, the oxygen system has been off. And when you, we generated forecasts, we generated two forecasts, one where the oxygen system stays on and one where it stays off. In this case, uh, and, and the blue shows that the oxygen, uh, if you add oxygen to nine meters, it, the oxygen uh, will go up. And ultimately it did. And that's what the observations show uh, here. The second question is, hey, you know, the, the managers have been running the oxygen system. Uh, during the summer, and they want to know, can I turn it off? I might be able to save money. If I can turn it off and, and the oxygen levels don't decline at a uh, tremendous rate, uh, then you know, we can um, possibly save a little money. Uh, and so what here shows is that we, we kept it on, 
a scenario and turned it off. And that was another scenario. And you can show here that, that turning it off results in the decline in oxygen at nine meters. And, uh, and that ultimately is what happened in the observations. And finally, on the panel C here, sa says, hey, you know, we've been continuing doing this. Um, it's getting into the fall. Uh, what can we turn off the system? And in this case, the, the oxygen levels maintained uh, elevated levels in both of the scenarios, uh, which indicated that it was okay to turn it off without having a detrimental impact on oxygen at nine meters. And this just gives you an example of how scenarios can be brought into ecological forecasts. When there are actionable steps that could be taken by uh, a manager um, with you know within the time frame of the forecast. So that was an overview of the forecasting system. Let's look under the hood a little bit um, at the uh, kind of some of the cyber infrastructure and automation. So I'm going to talk about uh, kind of some of the details in the context of the unified forecasting development approach, uh, which we put together um, as part of uh, a. a um, a proposal uh, to the National Science Foundation. And uh, so this unified forecasting development approach starts with um, an, e an ecological model. Um, and, th and this approach was developed by um, uh, many folks in EFI um, as a collaborative effort. So the ecological models, you start with ecological models that you need to uh, kind of get working in the cyber infrastructure that you know you ultimately need to use. And again, the ecological model we used was a general lake model, which does temperature and water quality variables at multiple depths. It's 1D. Uh, and so how do you get the ecological model to run in a uh, kind of a, a forecast cyber infrastructure? The key is thinking about how it's already used. So the way that the, the general lake model is used is um, you, ha you have a, a configuration file that describes the lake um, description, uh, parameters, um, settings, and initial conditions all in one file. And that's a text file. Um, that's a particular format called a name list. And so you can see here that, you know, there's a whole little chunk in it called morphology, which has to basically turn all of this three-dimensional structure over here uh, into the one-dimensional structure where you have heights and areas at each height. Um, and so the, the morphology, you know, you have inflows that you have to describe the characteristics of those inflows, like what angle it's coming in, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and you also have initial conditions, which are these init profiles here. Uh, and you have parameters like coefficients for mixing, things like that. And all of these uh, normally are set at the beginning of the run by a user and you run for 10 years and you use it to kind of analyze the reservoir. Um, and then you have to have the drivers um, in a particular format. In this case, they're CSV files describing the meteorology inflows and outflows and particular, you know, kind of headers and things like that. Um, so you need to have that. Um, those are then, um, uh, you know, has to be placed in a directory where then an executable, so an already compiled uh, version of the code is run at a command line, uh, you know, where you just type in the, like dot slash glm and it runs. Um, and the code here is on GitHub. Um, so it's, it's a community resource that's kind of separate from the forecasting framework. Um, the forecasting framework just uses the executable. And you want to be able to use the original, you want to be able to use this executable as it is um, so that you, it tracks along with the, the model that the community is using more generally. And because of that, what we've had to do is some of the efforts to get this working the forecasting system, we've pushed back uh, into the code base so that the, 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 the code that everyone's using is improving and evolving um, through the process of developing the forecasting system. So everyone's using the same forecasting, uh, the GLM, instead of us having some unique version that's only designed for um, our forecasting framework. That also allows us to ingest uh, if someone makes an improvement to the GLM, we can improve, we can directly use their improvements to improve our forecasts um, because we didn't do anything specialized to the model. So you run that and 
uh, and then that produces output, and that output is a net CDF file. So you can see that we have uh, kind of a nameless format text file, we have CSV files, and we have uh, net CDF files um, that are all part of the just baseline running uh, the uh, GLM. And so to get it working in a forecasting framework, you have to, 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 to work on the glue um, to kind of get this running in a, in a more iterative way. And so you need to write, or we wrote code uh, that updates the initial parameters and initial conditions within the configuration file. Um, instead of you know, manipulating it by hand, there's code that, uh, that populates this particular file. Um, and you need to be able to convert the net CDF file, that's the output file, into the format that's used for data assimilation. And then you need to be able to convert the format of the states that's output from the data assimilation into the format that's needed by this configuration file. Because we don't want to modify the model to get rid of this configuration file. Um, we'd rather modify this configuration file than modify the base code to um, handle data simulation internally. Uh, and then we also need to convert weather and inflow forecasts to model specific forecasts um, and the model specific time interval as well. Um, you know, it, it uses hourly meteorology and daily inflow data. So you gotta be able to work on, you know, uh, th these were key kind of cyber infrastructure improvements to convert what is a widely used process model into uh, kind of for data simulation and forecasting. And when it comes down to it, you know, uh, we use we use R, and you know, we wrote functions that to update the name list based on, you know, where the current temperatures are. Um, uh, from you know, this is the temperatures for that ensemble member uh, at that time step, um, and the you know the current meteorology file um, because each ensemble member is assigned kind of a different meteorology file going forward into the future. You know, when we do the forecasting. And then we update that name list with a custom built function. You execute uh, the GLM executable in R. Uh, there's you know, commands that, that allow you to do that. In this case, we use the system2 command. And then we wrote a custom function that takes the, nets, the generic netcf output name, output.nc, and extracts the variables at the depths that we need um, for uh, um, putting into the ensemble common filter. So there's the data acquisition step as part of the unified forecasting development approach. And our, you know, as I showed earlier, we use these, these gateways um, to extract data from the Campbell loggers and uh, push them to GitHub. And you know, all that code is basically, it's written in uh, shell script um, that is in a repository on uh, GitHub. Uh, and you know th this was I was written by our computer science uh, collaborators, and they do different things about pushing and pulling and checking errors in the system, understanding why there might be missing data, things like that. This sits on the gateway and handles moving it to uh, to the cloud, or in this case, to GitHub. Um, and the data then shows up on GitHub. In case th this is a uh, we we've named all our gateways. This is Mia. Mia has the in situ data and it's called catwalk.csv. And so the data gets pushed, that only the new data gets pushed to the cloud. It, there isn't a new uh, to GitHub, there, and there isn't a new file that shows up every day. It just gets appended to this catwalk file. So we can always, uh, when we're um, processing data for forecasting, we don't have to look for new file names. We just pull from GitHub, and catwalk.csv is the file that we'll be working with. And there's also maintenance things here. So uh, if a you know a technician uh, goes out to the site and turns off an instrument to fix it or pulls out of the water, they come back and enter what they did in a certain format into this maintenance log. And our automated QAQC scripts will take that and um, process that uh, so that you know to to deal to deal with um, uh, data that should be thrown out due to maintenance reasons. And this is the file that we get off the Campbell logger that gets pushed to GitHub. It's a, um, uh, you know, like, a, 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 you know, a, the standard kind of data logger file you get from Campbell that we then have to process. We also have to access the, the NOAA Ensemble Forecasting System, which we download 
Um, there's some great um, packages in R that allow you to download just the grid cell that you need of just the variables that you need. Um, we process that on our server uh, using R and we push that to GitHub, which then uh, when you execute, um, the, the, these are occurring every day. Um, and, and then when you execute the flare um, and run the general lake model, it pulls from GitHub the, um, the, the meteorology file for the particular reservoir. And the scripts to download and process um, are located here. And so now we have this automated forecasting where we're updating and evaluating the model. And we use the ensemble common filter. And so our number of states are the number of depths by the number of state variables plus the number of parameters fit. In this case, we have 29 depths that we model. Uh, one variable, and um, in the example I gave you one variable, but now when you add water quality, you start adding oxygen, chlorophyll A, nitrate, ammonium, you know, phosphorus, so it, it gets very large, and you're up to like 500 states um, when you do the number of water quality variables by the depths. And one of the reasons why we have so many depths is because you, you need to be able to um, have the embedded information of the thermal structure so that you can anticipate uh, turnover um, and you know, very uh, kind of rapid changes uh, in the thermal structure that would be hard if you were mo modeling uh, very few depths because the only um, memory, uh, you, because you're, you're, you're taking the depths out of the model, converting them to the depths that you're uh, doing the ensemble common filter on, and then you're passing those depths back into the model. Uh, so yeah, you really have to kind of figure out the, the number of depths that's needed. And so we take, yet, so th this red dot here is um, yesterday's output uh, uh, you know, from yesterday's data, the assimilation of yesterday's data. You take that as input, you run from yesterday to today using the observed meteorology, you pull in the observational data, you compare it to you use an ensemble filter to um, assimilate that data to set the initial conditions for a 16-day forecast using the NOAA meteorology. And so you have the output of yesterday's DA, you have today's DA, and then you have the forecast. So then when the forecast is completed, we move it to a, a, a repository. Um, and you know, in, in this case, we, we push it to GitHub um, and it's just a NetCDF file uh, that then gets pushed um, each day. Um, and we push a lot of them, so you can't really, it says months ago here, um, but that they're, they're, they're there and available to, for um, someone to pull uh, to examine them and plot them. And finally, we, we make um, uh, you know, uh, emails for our, the water managers. And this example of the email that they get. Um, so part of the design choices that went into this, one, they're very interested in the turnover. So we put that on the left. And on the right, they're, they're interested in the historical trajectory almost as much as the future trajectory. And so that's why we added the, these uh, ob observed temperatures here from the sensors. And then we have the future and we chose to only put um, three going into the future because one, it got noisy to see, and two, those are the depths where they have out, um, valves that they can remove water from the reservoir at. And so the key automation tasks, um, you, we had to download the NOAA uh, uh, Global Ensemble Forecasting System. You have to pull the sensor data from GitHub. You have to process ANOA data and QAQC, the sensor data. You have to locate the restart file from yesterday's forecast um, and your, your, you know, your, your files that describe the reservoir um, and uh, you know, other configurations. You have to run the data simulation and forecasting. You push that to the repository, email the, the management relevant visualizations, and ideally by the start of a shift, update and save the restart configuration info file for tomorrow um, and uh, report you know, whether there's a success or a failure so that you know whether it ran correctly or not and then wait uh, to the next day of the forecast. And there's many different ways to do this automation. The paper you read um, from Ethan White um, you know, talked about their approach. Um, and one thing I wanna emphasize is that you can start iterative forecasting um, where it's semi-automated 
um, uh, or automated uh, without, you don't have to know that much computer science. For example, this code here on the right is, I mean, it is an infinite loop, it run forever. Um, but you know, this is a very basic way uh, to do a forecast where you load the last success R data, that's the restart file uh, and the date uh, where you currently are. And you basically, you get a bunch of information here where you have, um, where you know what uh, forecast you need to look for. And so you um, set up uh, a name for a NOAA, uh, the, basically the, the, the NOAA file that we're looking for, has it appeared on GitHub through our process of pushing uh, the, the NOAA forecasts uh, every day to GitHub. And if it's there, so if you can find the file that you're looking for, when you do a git pull, um, then um, forecast available equals true, and it will um, move out of this while loop. Uh, otherwise, it will wait for some set amount of time uh, to check again uh, whether that file is then there. And once you uh, once you leave that forecast, once you leave this sort of waiting for the forecast, the NOAA forecast to show up, uh, you then start and run your forecast. Um, this is run flare. We get the restart file that will be used to to start tomorrow's uh, forecast, data simulation forecast. You know, we plot so that we make some plots, and then we save uh, this file that basically says when was the last successful day um, that we can use to uh, detect success or failures, um, and tells it tells the file location of where the initial conditions are for tomorrow's forecast. And then this down here is just, um, you know, if you want to make sure not, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, you want to run a number of forecasting cycles before it shuts down because you want to, you know, manually go in and check how it's doing. And so, you know, something like this, which just a, is like system sleep and, um, you know, while loops um, is uh, a very basic way. You just put this. Um, you know, run run this in R in the background of your computer, and it will generate forecasts um, you know, uh, semi-automatedly. You would not want to deploy a uh, you know a, a system that others heavily depend on in this way, um, or you need to combine this with other ways to ensure that it is sort of guaranteed to run. Um, but this sort of highlights that you don't you don't have to use some sophisticated system to generate uh, automated forecasts. And you know where we're at now in this project is trying to move to a little bit more state of the art uh, cyber infrastructure and automation, where you think about all the components of uh, the the automation step or the forecasting kind of cycle as containers. And a container is a um, a package of kind of code that also includes the operating system and all packages that can be run as a standalone uh, piece that um, can reference the file system on the computer so it can get inputs and can spit outputs in. But when you close that container, um, you, you, you know, there's no record of that, that code or that instance of that container. But what's great about it is that um, it can run on any system. Um, you know, the container, the code within the container thinks it's in a Unix system, but the container can run in a Windows or in a Mac or, or anywhere. And so it allows for reproducibility and, and the ability to kind of um, uh, run on many different kinds of systems and it also helps with reproducibility. And so, and then you need to orchestrate these containers. Um, and what we're working with is called OpenWhisk, uh, which is a way to use kind of events to trigger actions. Um, you know, when the NOAA downloads appears, do this. And, and it, it's a way to kind of um, build in the, um, uh, the automation rules. And so this example is, uh, you know, where we, we actually have a central, a central Git server that's where the data that comes out uh, of each of these containers gets pushed by that container. Um, and that central Git server um, kind of persists and all these others open and um, are launched and shut down uh, over the forecasting cycle. And so the process of doing this forecasting led our team to kind of revisit and think about what are the lessons learned? And so I'll kind of walk through these. Lesson one, building and maintaining a forecasting system takes an, inter, an interdisciplinary, highly coordinated team. 
uh, let the, I mean, the computer scientists really know what they're doing with automation and cyber infrastructure and, you know, and um, let, you know, let them handle what they're good at, but they have, you have to be able to talk and communicate the, the problem that's trying to be solved in a very clear way, which involves building trust and a long-term development and involves a uh, regular meeting so that um, uh, things don't get too off course. You know, one group goes down one route, another group goes down another route, and then they, they don't interface well. Um, you know, our project has uh, bi-weekly meetings. Um, you know, uh, lesson two, the cyber infrastructure is not trivial. Um, and, you know, take that into account um, from, from the beginning. If you want to have a fully automated system, you need to have computer scientists on your team. Uh, let your forecasting goals uh, guide your modeling approach. You know, uh, if we were just forecasting um, chlorophyll A at the surface, possibly a time series model less complex than the process-based physics model would be ideal. But if you want to forecast turnover, uh, you know, you need a physically-based model to do that. Um, and if you want to be able to forecast a lot of water quality variables at the same time, then that gets into a more complex modeling framework. But if you can get by with a simple model, don't just start with the big process model from the beginning. Um, and also be prepared uh, to have to modify the model um, to deal with uh, the, um, the hop starting and um, you know, things that you encounter in the process of developing your forecast. Uh, you know, uncertainty partitioning informs the forecast interpretation and forecast development. Um, that kind of goes without saying. <laughs> Um, you know, we intentionally thought about, uh, pull, you know, we, we designed it around the NOAA forecasting system and, you know, the idea of having uncertainty in the downscaling, uh, observational uncertainty um, was, a, you know, something that we uh, put emphasis on uh, and, um, you know, really kind of characterizing where the different uncertainty points are in both the observational system and the modeling system. Human-centered design improves the utility of forecast for managers. That was the kind of working with and, 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 and you know, physically actually being co-located for uh, observational time periods, um, you know, like sitting down in their office and watching how they work, um, kind of helps improve uh, the utility of forecast uh, for managers. And th those figures I showed kind of highlight that. Uh, forecast should be reproducible and archived. Uh, and, you know, and then also sustainability plans are needed for short and long-term forecasting maintenance. The sensors are gonna go down the systems aren't going to endlessly run themselves. Um, the cyber infrastructure may be automated, but it needs someone to watch over it. Uh, and so a sustainability plan um, is important. And so uh, you know, I assigned the article by Ethan White as reading for this component of the class. And you know, I, I think it's a great study of how they've approached similar concepts in similar and different ways. Um, for example, they highlight these key tasks, uh, data entry, data sharing, data manipulation, modeling and forecasting, archiving and presentation. Um, and they do it in different ways using websites and um, you know, uh, they talk about a, a particular uh, tool called uh, Travis. Um, you know, they use field entered data that um, requires kind of uh, building up the tape and QAQ seeing the tables. Um, rather than sensor data. So there's a lot of differences and similarities between. So I encourage you to, to read this paper and uh, think about how there's the, uh, the similarities and differences between the cyber infrastructure that I've described here. And also in that paper, they talk about the best practices. <clears throat> and so I wanted to go through a, 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 our own self-assessment for our project of the best practices highlighted uh, in Ethan's paper. So box one. Um, they talk about these key practices for iterative forecasting. First, frequent data collection. Uh, frequent data collection allows models to be regularly updated. Um, we get a gold star for that. We're having data come in. Um, you know, it, it's collected 10 minute. It shows up at GitHub um, you know, uh, each day. And we could show it up more. We just don't want to uh, you know, push that regularly. And that goes to the, actually the second one, which you get a gold star, rapid data release under open licenses. Uh, the data from this project are available in near instantaneous uh, availability with low latency, which is the time between it was collected and when it becomes available. And it's a, you know, sits on a public repository on GitHub. And so it can be accessed by a community of forecasters. 
best practice in data structure. You know, uh, to reduce the time and effort needed to incorporate data in the models, best practice and data structure should be employed for managing and storing the collection to ensure interoperability. I would give us half a gold star. You know, um, the, the files that come off of the, the Campbell loggers are using kind of a water um, uh, format that is commonly used by sensor networks. But, you know, we're not, uh, you, know, you know, necessarily using all like, you know, the climate and forecasting convention uh, variable names in our, uh, um, in, in, in our kind of uh, download NOAA product, things like that. So I, I think we're doing a nice job, um, but we can always uh, improve our data structure uh, better to think about um, what is the, 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 the most um, extensible and interoperable approach. Uh, focus on uncertainty. Um, we've really pushed this hard and I think we get a gold star for that. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we're trying to, you know, uh, reduce or account for initial condition uncertainty, process uncertainty, uh, parameter uncertainty and as much as you can with uh, an ensemble common filter, uh, you know, NOAA meteorology uncertainty, etc. Compare forecast to simple baselines. Uh, you know, we're, we're forecasting with a persistence null um, that includes process error. So I'd give us a gold star there. It'd be nicer to have more additional simple baselines, but um, I think that uh, the, the simple null is, is, is where we are now, and I'm pleased with that. Uh, number six, compare and combine multiple modeling approaches. I give us not quite half a gold star here. Um, I think that uh, you know, we're not forecasting with GLM and you know, uh, other uh, Hindcasting, or sorry, other um, hydrodynamic models um, at the same time. Um, you know, others in our group are developing models of kind of DO and chlorophyll A that, that could be a, uh, compared, but we're not automatically uh, generating um, alternative modeling uh, forecasts. Uh, best practice for software development. Um, I think we're following, um, we have a license. Uh, we have a, a, a document guide. Um, on, we have version control and uh, cross-platform uh, support. Um, I say that uh, half a gold star because I think that um, the, what I showed you with um, this next generation stuff we're working on with containers uh, and OpenWhisk, that will give us that extra half a star that, I'm, that, that I think I'm looking for. Uh, support easy inclusion of models. It, that's about a quarter star. Uh, we had a uh, colleague um, adapt the model to a lake in uh, Fia or Lake Fia in Ireland using a different model, got him. Um, you, know, you have to be kind of an expert right now to know how to do it. It's definitely possible, um, but it's, it, you know, um, if you know what you're doing and you're good at R and uh, you're, you're kind of familiar with the modeling, you're, the model you're trying to build in, then it can be done. Uh, it's not intentionally not to be able to do that, um, but I won't, I won't say it's easy. So that's why it gets a quarter star. Automated end-to-end -end reproducibility. Again, uh, we have automation. Uh, once we build the container architecture in with the open whisk, I think that'll give us that other star or other half a star. Um, that'll, but, um, uh, but right now we are able to run the model in an automated fashion in a reproducible way because um, you know, the, the code and the output and everything is um, being pushed to GitHub. Uh, publicly archiving forecasts. Uh, I, you know, we, I give us three out of four, or you know, three quarters of a star um, because our forecasts are pushed to GitHub, so they are publicly available. It just, GitHub is not um, a, uh, an ideal repository. Um, I think the community is still looking for the ideal repository to push uh, the forecast to, in a way that um, is persistent and um, you know gets a DOI without uh, basically minting a new DOI uh, like you would for a data set uh, every new forecast that's being produced. And so the ecological forecasting initiative is really uh, working hard on figuring out how to best to publicly archive forecast. So when we move to that system where you can upload into a non-GitHub repository um, that do that does produce DOIs. Uh, and can do that in a way that um, that recognizes that the iterative nature of forecasting uh, will be the other uh, quarter of a star that I think is missing there. 
so that's my kind of overview of um, the, the Flare system and the uh, how it kind of relates to best practices, cyber infrastructure, and automation. And I, um, you know, please email me if you have any um, questions about the uh, presentation, Flare. Um, always happy to sh to share my thoughts.